Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so welcome everybody. I'm glad that we're getting to gather together to talk about this. Um, we're going to go through a lot of different therapeutic treatments for anxiety for adults um, with Asperger autism profiles. And I hope to kind of bring us through a big long list of options and have give you some time to reflect on them and just give you a sense of what's out there, what might be a good fit for you or for the person you're here representing. So let's dive right in. So first, I'm actually curious who's watching. So you'll see a poll option pop up shortly, and um, we'll get to see just, I think, I believe that you'll see the percentages. You'll see sort of who we have out of these categories, if you'd like to give us an answer here so I know who we're talking to tonight. So, so far, it looks like an overwhelming number of parent, family, and friends. Great, great, that's awesome. Good, and I'm sure we'll have some more people signing on a little bit, a few minutes in, and they'll be able to dive right in. So um, you can uh, think about all of this information on this webinar tonight as it would apply to the person you're here supporting or apply to yourself and think about what might be a good fit, what have you tried before, what might you want to ask some questions from me about. Um, I'm happy to have any questions. Like Joanne said, you can type those in, and if it makes sense, I'll try to answer them along the way of the presentation, or I'll at least look through them at the end as we go through. So I'm not gonna talk a ton about what anxiety is in the background because fortunately this is part of a anxiety webinar series and there's already a presentation devoted to that and it's already recorded and you can access that if you haven't seen it yet. It's called Understanding and Assessing Anxiety and Autism and it's by Matthew Goodwin. But I will just kind of walk us through a few sort of foundational points that I want us to be thinking about when we think about the different ways that anxiety might be treated. So first of all, what does anxiety look like? This could look like a lot of things as we see on this display here. It could be physical experiences. It could be what's happening in your mind. It could be sleep disturbance, other in, in ways that it influences your life. And just like there are many different symptoms, there are many different ways that other that people experience this differently and you might find that there are certain treatments that work for one person more than the other or certain treatments that maybe that maybe cover one of these symptoms better and another treatment covers another symptom so there's going to be a lot of things to think about in terms of the experience of anxiety and how that relates to what treatment you decide to use as well as what it looks like is where does anxiety happen? So these are just a few of the many examples. There could, it could depend on the environment, it could depend on the situation, it could depend on the time of day. Some people experience a lot of anxiety as they're trying to go to sleep at night. And it could also be really kind of ongoing anxiety as well. It could be certain levels of anxiety that feel pretty prevalent all the time. And so again, different treatments might help in different situations. And so as we were talking about the different choices here, we're looking for somewhat of the right fit. And I wanted to make sure we talked about sort of some middle ground between a totally wrong fit, totally perfect fit. As you can see, there can be a totally wrong fit. That's just quite not quite going to work. <laughs> and then um, there can be some treatment approaches that are... Um, that are sort of, they work in ways, but you need to supplement it with something else or that they need some adjusting to, to get them to start working. So there might be some things that are worth giving a try, even though they're not immediately perfect fit. And then of course, ideally, we're always looking for those approaches that feel just like a perfect fit, something that really makes sense to the way that you think about things already, something that makes you feel really comfortable, working with a person that makes you feel really comfortable. So as we go along, I'd like to invite you to think about that sort of like totally wrong fit, totally perfect fit, and also those ones that kind of fall in the middle ground. So I'll be talking tonight um, roughly in, a, in three different categories, and I definitely say roughly as this Venn diagram overlaps, they definitely all overlap quite a bit. Um, some topics I'll be talking about, they can, you can experience them in a lot of different ways. But for the sake of making a little more sense of it all, I've broken it down into a few parts. So first we'll talk about psychotherapeutic approaches. So this is 
mental health counselors and people in the mental health field and services that you can access that way. Uh, there's complementary treatment we'll go through. These are other sort of healing services or, or services that you might work with a teacher or someone guiding you through a process that's really meant to teach you something. And then there's the sort of self-directed option where, which might be overlapping quite a bit with these other topics, or it might be just things that you can do really on your own that felt kind of worthy of bringing into this presentation as options. So we'll talk kind of through all those three categories so you get some, a, a whole lot of options to think about in terms of approaches to treatment. So we'll get right into the psychotherapy topic. I'll be going through a lot of different approaches and talking about what might be good for anxiety about that approach, what might good, be good especially for Asperger autism profiles, and then a little bit about how exactly you access those services. Before I go into the topics, I like to talk about um, the professional themselves, the practitioner, the person who um, is giving you this information is a very important part. It could be that you decide, oh, this technique is perfect for me. This is what I need to do. But one therapist or one practitioner is going to be really different from another sometimes. And there's a few pieces I especially wanted to point out here. One is their level of Asperger autism expertise. It's really ideal to get someone who understands the Asperger autism spectrum and can know how to work with you, know how to understand how your mind works and how to adapt their approaches to you. Um, but it's not always possible. And so sort of secondary and in addition to that is some as a practitioner is able to adapt to your specific needs, able to be really creative. Um, it's great to get both of these things, but there's also some cases where you meet with a professional who doesn't have a ton of Asperger autism expertise, but they're really great at really listening and really figuring out the way you think and adapting their approach to you. So they, one or both is possible. And then of course, each one is a, is a unique person and sometimes there's a personality fit or a personality clash. And so these are just a few things to remind you that there's a lot to think about when you choose a professional, and then we'll be talking a lot about the different um, theoretical approaches that we'll, that we'll be able to consider as options. Another piece here, um, I'll be talking mostly just about the specific approaches, but I want to remind you that there's individual as well as group therapy options for most of these and you might want to think for a moment about the pros and cons of either of those options individual therapy of course can be really great because it's private you don't have to have that social interaction with more than just the therapist the therapist can really adjust the approach and work with you to exactly what you need um, and then group therapy can also be really beneficial for a lot of reasons. It, one, because it does have that social aspect, especially if you're dealing with social anxiety, coming into a group can be a very good experience of dealing with that social anxiety. You also will be able to make connections with people. You'll be able to see from person to person that you're not the only one experiencing this type of anxiety. Um, but then again, the group therapy can sometimes be a little bit more generalized to the needs of the whole group and perhaps the social piece isn't right for you right now and so you get to choose between the two or you can also you can also try both and sometimes it's good to have a combination so we'll start right in with some topics so the first one is cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT and so this one is a very commonly used approach and very well researched. It's a, a lot of people use this for many different um, mental health um, reasons, but especially it's very helpful for anxiety. And what I'll do is I'll give you a sense of what it is, not a full overview, but just so you have an idea of what CBT looks like, what it might look like if you were to receive that type of treatment. And then we'll talk a little bit about specifics related to anxiety and Asperger autism profiles. So CBT is the focus on relationships among thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. 
And so the idea is that these thoughts, your thoughts affect your feelings and your feelings then affect your behaviors, but they don't necessarily go in that order. And so you kind of record them and pay attention to each of them. You note that your behaviors affect your thoughts, your feelings affect your behaviors, and then those affect your thoughts. So there's a lot of moving parts here and CBT can sometimes help us by actually oftentimes writing these out so you have a better awareness of what's going on. And the idea is that we pay attention to these thoughts and get to know these automatic thoughts that come up in certain situations. And we especially look at these sort of unhelpful automatic thoughts and we might call them cognitive distortions or unhelpful thinking styles. And we, in CBT, you're able to learn a lot of um, vocabulary. You, there's a lot of handouts. There's a lot of resources to help you not just talk about each specific thought, but learn how to label the thoughts as what kind of unhelpful thinking style is this. And then the last part here is that you think of rational responses, and there's also some sort of vocabulary, some instruction about how you think of a rational response to a negative thought that's really not serving you. So there's a lot of structure in CBT. I have a few visuals here to give you a sense of what you might be looking at, what this might be to practice this. This is a pretty, is one version of a pretty common um, visual in CBT is again that relationship between thoughts, emotions, and behaviors, and the idea that they all affect one another. And so in CBT, you would be often starting with the thought part, but perhaps in some situations starting with the emotion and retracing back to the thought and kind of spelling out what happened so you can challenge what happened. This is another example of a handout. It's pretty small. I'm not going to talk through the whole thing. It's more here so that you have a sense of what you might be working with. I mentioned before unhelpful thinking styles. And so you can see how this might be really useful to have this visual, to have this categorization of thoughts to refer to when a problem comes up or when you expect a problem might come up. For example, the first one is all or nothing thinking, which is also called black and white thinking, which can be common um, for people with Asperger autism profiles to, for different, to different levels. And, and it's also common to people across the board. So if you find yourself having a thought like, I am a complete failure or something like that, you can say, whoa, where did that thought come from? Because that is a very all or nothing thought. It's saying it's completely one way and not the other way. And can I challenge that? This is an example, of course, they're all different. People use different types of thought records. This one here is actually available on psychologytools.org, which, um, for example, you can check out websites like that. You can look up CBT resources, and you can find these things online as well. Um, but just to give you a sense of what this might look like, you might have a, work with a therapist who actually asks you to do some quote unquote homework between sessions where in the moment or really right after the moment, you write out what happened, what triggered you, what you, you might even challenge the thought in the worksheet and, t and think of some alternatives. And that way you have something to bring to your next session, which can also be really helpful to have some structure like that. So let's look at the ways it relates to anxiety and Asperger autism profiles. So it's helpful for anxiety because it gives you techniques that you can really use in the moment. And it also educates you about how your anxiety works. You learn a lot about yourself. Um, for Asperger autism profiles, it's really helpful because um, for some people report that they don't find a lot of use in just sharing and getting reflection back or talking about situation specific solutions, but this one actually teaches you practical skills that you can apply to different situations. So they show you, they teach you a technique. Um, as you saw, there's a lot of handouts and visuals available if that really helps you learn. And there's also tends to be mostly a focus on thoughts, which can be helpful if you consider yourself kind of a literal or logical thinker and someone who is kind of has more of a sense of your thoughts than other parts of your experience. It might make sense for you to start with CBT. Um, how do you access it? 
can find a trained therapist who specifically does CBT. Uh, you can also find therapists who are influenced by or incorporate CBT like practices into their work, depending on what you're looking for, depending on what's available. Um, like you can find this in a therapy group. And as I said, there's also sort of reading and worksheets as well as apps, applications for your phone um, that you can find to help you work through CBT process. Of course, in really all of these that I'll be talking about tonight, you get a lot more out of working directly with a professional, but there's also other options that you can use to, in addition to that or instead of it for whatever reason. So we'll go right on next to mindfulness. And this is such a big category and there are some other approaches that are sort of more structured that are based on mindfulness concepts and there's way too many to go through in one presentation so I thought I'd cover mindfulness and let you know that there are really a lot of different approaches and you can kind of start out by just thinking about if mindfulness is an approach that makes sense for you. Just for example, um, there's MBSR which is mindfulness-based stress reduction and that's one of the more widely known sort of more structured mindfulness approaches and there's a lot more as well but let's talk about mindfulness more generally so mindfulness is a practice of focusing on the present moment and building awareness of our thoughts and our experiences if you take a look at the little image here you get a good sense of the difference between mindful and mindful um, you can see the, the person on the left is distracted by their thoughts and it looks like a lot of actually negative concerns and there doesn't they don't seem to have anything there that has to do with where they currently are and then the dog here which is what we aim to go toward um, with mindfulness is actually thinking of the landscape in front of him and so in, in mindfulness, one thing that especially stands out is that it's both about coping with anxiety and reducing anxiety, as well as increasing the level of joy and the, in, and the happiness that you have in your life. Because if you're able to bring yourself to the present moment, you not only can possibly reduce anxiety, but you can increase those um, positive experiences. And so with this goal of reducing anxiety and increasing positive experiences, it's, it can be a little hard to um, practice that first because it involves accepting your experiences as they are and noticing them without judgment. And so in mindfulness, we learn about the ways that we, when we fight against what's happening or we judge what's happening, that's where a lot of the anxiety or the other emotions end up coming up it's more from that than usually from what's actually happening in the present moment. Um, and the idea of mindfulness is that when we allow our thoughts to just be and we don't engage with them, we're able to let go of the thoughts and just let them pass. And so in mindfulness, you get to learn to practice to have a different relationship with your thoughts. Mindfulness encourages us to see our thoughts also as just a process of our brain, and we see that they don't define us or control us. Um, we think of thoughts as just thoughts and that they're not necessarily true or real. This is sort of a step away from CBT, um, where CBT, you're looking a little bit more carefully at the thoughts and you're challenging them and you're trying to change them and in mindfulness it's a little bit more about just seeing that okay my mind is running through this thought pattern but i'm going to redirect myself to what i'm doing instead or i'm going to redirect myself to my breath or redirect myself to something that i can look at that's positive for me so that can be really helpful and overall the idea is that being mindful will then lead to more patience and compassion for yourself and for others and for the environment. And so this is really important that it's not just, it, it sort of usually starts with internal, but then that also applies to having patience and accepting sort of where others are as well as your environment or the world around you. Okay. So 
what is good for anxiety about mindfulness? So one is the present moment focus. If we think about anxiety, it's often worrying about the future, sometimes worrying about the past um, or a combination of the two. And so if mindfulness is about bringing to you the present moment, that is a really direct action um, to deal with your anxiety. It also teaches you a new theory about how to see the world and live life. Mindfulness is a lot about sort of just really changing the way you see things. So it, it, it creates a change on a very broad level if you practice it. Um, why is it good for Esper autism profiles? Um, one is there's direct training about how to have choice in what you focus on. So it's really a practice. It's a training of your mind to be able to make those choices. And um, specific to Asperger autism profiles, t I tend to hear a report of a lot of excessive thoughts or your mind racing, just kind of overwhelming um, process of thoughts. So in, in a way, like we said with CBT, it might be helpful to address the thoughts directly with CBT, and it might also be helpful or helpful to address it with mindfulness that actually directs some attention away from those thoughts. It depends person to person or sort of what part of your process you're in. And so and one thing else I'd like to say too is that some mindfulness techniques are better than others for person to person. So kind of just a, if you don't like one approach, don't, don't totally give up on mindfulness necessarily. If, if sitting meditation doesn't work for you, you can pretty much be mindful in anything that you do. You can be mindful in activities like cooking or cleaning, or you can um, mindfully go for a walk, or you can just kind of reflect back on your experiences mindfully. So there's just a lot of variety of how you can approach this. And this is also where it comes back that if you have a, a therapist who can really respond to your needs, then they can make mindfulness uh, accessible to anybody. Um, it's also important to remember that it's a practice. And so sometimes mindfulness practices can feel hard instead of, and so instead of just relieving anxiety, they actually feel hard at first, but it's about that practice. And that's what gives you the results you're looking for. How do you access it? You can work with a trained therapist. You can go to a mindfulness um, class. There's actually classes that are a little bit more of like an educational technique class than a group. Um, you can go to just meditation groups. There's um, groups in, in, in the community even that aren't um, mental health specifically, but just groups for people to come meditate together. Um, you can, of course, do some reading about mindfulness. Uh, and again, there's apps and there's things like online guided meditations and things like that. So there's a whole lot out there. So we'll move right straight along to another topic here. One is dialectical behavioral th behavior therapy with, or DBT. And so dialectical behavior therapy, the first word there that might be sort of new for you or not as often used is dialectical. And so that means the synthesis or integration of opposites. And so just to give you an example of that, because that still might not be super, um, ex super familiar. Uh, so that, for example, that could be this idea that in, in DBT, you're working um, actually with mindfulness um, and this idea of accepting things and tolerating things as they are, but you're also working on being able to change the way you react and change your experience. And so if you were to fully accept things the way they are, um, then why would you want to change them? But if you're changing them, then why would you accept them? And if you, if you find yourself getting kind of stuck in, in sort of two opposites like that, the DBT might actually be helpful because part of the focus is being able to figure out how to hold those two things at once to be true. Um, so that can be really helpful. So four main skill areas are covered in mindfulness. So one in DBT, mindfulness is the first one um, that we talked about. So you have a good familiarity of that, hopefully. Um, and the next is distress tolerance. And so that's the ability to get through that stress. Um, next is interpersonal effectiveness. So that can be really helpful. You can learn exactly how to really respectfully ask for what you want and, um, and really have more open and clear communication with other people. 
And then the last piece is emotional regulation. So this is, again, after the awareness and the presence and the tolerance, there's these actions you can do to learn to change the emotions that you do want to change and you feel like you can change. Just glancing at the questions for a second. Um, so there's four parts to DBT treatment. Um, this might be, if you go to a really um, structured DBT program, then you're going to get all these four parts. It's possible you might work with a the therapist who just brings in parts of DBT. Again, that's sort of based on preference for what you find. But officially in DBT, there's four parts. One is a DBT skills training group. And then there's a DBT individual therapy process. And those actually would happen at the same time and they build off of each other. And then another piece is DBT phone coaching. So that would happen in the moment when something comes up, you actually have someone you can call, you have a therapist you can call and they can talk you through it in the moment. And then also usually there's a DBT therapist consultation team. So that means the therapists that you're working with are really getting a lot of support and you know that they're really um, do it, giving you the best treatment that they can. Okay. So just an example of what you might see in DBT, another concept is the wise mind. And as you'll see, just like CBT, there's a lot of handouts and um, definitions and worksheets and things if that's helpful for you to have that visual. This, this is just one, just one example. Um, and just to give you an overview of wise mind, the idea of wise mind is that, that bringing that dialectical um, idea again, the idea that you have this emotional mind, you have your emotional reactions, you have your emotional wants and needs, and then you have your reasonable mind that can think logically and think about what, what makes sense in a situation intellectually. And the idea in DBT is that you're not choosing one over the other, you're actually having them work together to find a balance and make sure that you're addressing both sides and actually coming up with a solution that helps you in helps the both the emotional and the reasonable part of you. So why is it help for, for anxiety? Um, so first of all, it brings in mindfulness. So it's got a lot of that covered and it gives you techniques to use in the moment. It ex again educates you about how your anxiety works. And then why is it good for Asper autism profiles? Um, it again teaches practical skills. There's really official skills that you learn in practice. It's a well-structured program, so that can be really great for someone who go, does well when they know what to expect or they, they, they learn well when they're sort of repetition and reflecting on specific skill work. And um, again, as I said, the dialectical work can help with that flexible thinking if, if you're struggling with black and white thinking. And how do you access it? You can work with a trained therapist, with a therapy group. Again, in the official approach, you do both. And then there's also just like pretty much everything else, um, self-directed reading and worksheets and apps available. But again, if you want the full experience, you're going to get a lot more working with a professional. So another option here in um, psychotherapy approaches is biofeedback. And there's a lot on this slide. Again, as Joanne said, you're getting copies of this. So you can read through a little bit later. But just wanted you to be able to have this image, have this sense of what, what might be involved in biofeedback. So first of all, biofeedback is the electronic monitoring of a normally automatic bodily function used to train your train you to control that function. So that monitoring of that body function it helps you to be able to see what's happening and you work with a professional to change the way you're thinking, to change your experience, um, to, to actually change that automatic bodily function. And of course, these changes that happen in your body are usually associated with thought patterns. They're associated with the thoughts that come up with anxiety. And with biofeedback, you actually get a concrete process of measuring what's happening physically in your body. And you might have also heard of neurofeedback, and that one I actually pointed out here is um, is 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 a sort of under the umbrella of biofeedback. That's the anytime you're working with um, the brain waves, the activity of your brain, and you can actually um, there's a lot of technology out there. You can they can actually measure um, the activity of your brain as you go through different um, activities and you go through different processes. 
another thing that you can experience is measurement of your breathing, your heart rate. Um, you can measure your muscle, muscle tension, your sweat glands even, and it, you can also have your temperature measured in biofeedback, which um, essentially measures the blood flow to your skin. And you, if you glance through here, you can see that um, biofeedback is used to treat a whole air range of, um, of, of issues, and this includes both mental health issues as well as um, physical issues and um, things like epilepsy, headaches, um, traumatic brain injury, uh, as well as anxiety and ADHD and all sorts of things. So there's just so much potential here. So why is it helpful for anxiety? Um, this one specifically addresses the physiological aspects of anxiety. It really directly ha helps you to pay attention to your body, helps you to pay attention to what's happening physically, and it gives you direct training to be able to change that experience. And then why is it good for Asperger autism profiles? One is that it clearly measures the experience, your experiences and the progress. So you actually can get some, whether it's numbers or a graph or whatever they're giving you, you get something really concrete and visual to show you either where you're at that moment or where you're, where, how you've progressed or, or even just the patterns. Perhaps you don't know what's causing your anxiety, but you're able to measure some patterns. Um, also, this focus on the body and, and any of these approaches that do focus on the body are going to be helpful for people either if you have a strong sort of sensory experience that you need help with dealing with or if you actually experience low body awareness, which is kind of the opposite, um, and you need this sort of extra help to learn to um, pay attention to your body or even just use this as an alternative. How do you access it? You can work with a trained therapist. And we'll also talk a little bit later about um, apps as well as wearables. Some, some biofeedback can be used really outside of the laboratory, outside of um, therapy. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go along later. So last sort of category here is expressive therapy. Um, you might also know this as creative arts therapy. This is the use of any of the arts in the context of therapy. And I'm gonna go through a few different ways that it might be used. Uh, first of all, you might work with an expressive therapist who uses all of the creative arts together or uses the ones as they apply. And as we go through, you'll see that there's also um, therapists that focus on art or dance or music or drama. Um, so let's take a look at what you might see. So with art therapy or using art in therapy, there's just such a, so, so much of a variety of ways that art can be used to help you deal with your anxiety. You can see on the bottom left here, someone has illustrated their anxiety. They've illustrated the different parts of it. They've used both words and visual. And a lot of times people experience that Either they can't express it verbally and expressing it visually helps them to understand it or even just getting it down on the paper makes it feel like it's not just stuck inside their head. Um, on the bottom right here, you have someone making a Zentangle, which um, you could look up Zentangles and learn to do that or you can even just kind of mindfully do some doodling that helps you sometimes to relax, have some one thing to focus on. A lot of people have been getting into things like coloring books. So you'll see that you can work with an art therapist, but you also can do some of this on your own. Um, and even just this, this peaceful picture um, of this painting by Claude Monet of the water lilies, um, even just viewing art, either just to look through for a relaxing experience or perhaps in therapy, you would look at artwork and choose something that um, says something about your anxiety or about how you wish things were different and it gives you a talking point. So there's so many approaches, but for visual thinkers, for creative thinkers or people who feel more comfortable making something than talking the whole time, this can be really helpful. And we'll go on to music therapy. You might use music to interact with other people in a group. You might work with your therapist to sort of make sounds that represent your anxious experience. You might use music as a just a fun anxiety reducing experience on your own. You might listen to music really um, just 
in moments of anxiety or as you're going to sleep. And just really, um, if you work with a music therapist, you can learn the benefits of using music to, to help you get through things like anxiety. And also, again, if you, if you have trouble expressing your experience verbally, maybe music is a way that you're able to do that. Dance movement therapy, another part. Again, we really, we can do, we can be looking at groups. We can be looking at looking at individual. Um, you might do movements that help you express how you feel her anxiety. You might even just be dancing to release and um, release some sort of anxiety built up in your body, um, as well as even just using dance on your own in your in your room to have to let out something that you're feeling. Also, there's writing therapy. Um, there's not really a um, writing therapist specificity, but um, people, you can, your, your therapist would often in, involve writing into therapy process, or you could use this yourself. Um, you might find that writing poetry about your experience of anxiety really helps you articulate what it is. You might find that reading other people's writing helps you feel not so alone. Um, keeping a journal can be helpful or even just writing stories that aren't even related to your anxiety, but just the process of writing can be a really great experience to help with anxiety. Drama therapy, there's a whole lot of ways that this can be used. On the bottom right, you see there's just a play here. Perhaps you're just going to see plays and to um, go for that experience of relating to other people and having a good time. In the middle here, you'll see there's uh, some improv acting happening. You might do this in a therapy group where you're learning to deal with social anxiety, uh, or you might even join an improv class, and that helps you make connections, learn how to be social and to get through that experience. Um, the bottom left here, there's actually a image of psychodrama, which is a type of drama therapy where you actually would explain to a group of people, or perhaps you'd work just one-on-one -on -one with a therapist, explaining, you know, what a situation, an anxious situation was like for you, and they'll help you act it out, and maybe think of ways to act it out in different ways that would have been more helpful. So there's a whole lot of ways this can be used. So kind of covering this whole range of the creative arts, here are some thoughts about why it might be helpful. For anxiety, um, first of all, the arts have can have a relaxing effect um, depending on the process that you're doing and also depending person to person. If you just naturally find doodling and drawing helpful, perhaps seeing an art therapist would be good because you can start there and you can build off of that drawing experience and either learn ways to make art more helpful in dealing with your anxiety or use what is helpful about drawing and translate that into ways you can think differently about different situations. Um, creating something external can sometimes help you get some distance from your experience and talk about it. And um, the arts can also be a good way if you're feeling some sort of not just moment to moment, but some sort of deeper anxieties about your life or some deeper fears. Sometimes the arts can be a little, a little better at um, handling or, or even just communicating what, what that feels like for you. Why is it good for Asperger autism profiles? Um, it's especially helpful if you have a pre-existing interest in the arts of some kind. Um, if something is naturally motivating and captivating to you, that's going to really be very good at capturing your attention even when you're anxious. It's gonna be better than anything else is because your brain has that natural interest in connecting to it and focusing on it. Um, also, the expressive arts can adapt to all kinds of learning processes and learning styles. You can kind of slow down the speed a little bit or even speed it up a little. Um, you can, if you're a visual learner, you can do it that way. If you learn by doing, you can act things out instead of just talking about them. There's a lot of potential there. Um, you might even find that you have a natural skill or a natural um, high creativity level and building that confidence in that process can be huge in, in um, reducing anxiety as well. As I said, um, improv, especially in drama, can be so directly um, a learning experience for social anxiety. And just a note too that 
some approaches to using the arts and therapy might feel a little abstract if you really kind of think about things really logically or concretely. Um, if someone asks you, you know, draw a picture of what your anxiety is and leaves it at that, that might feel too vague for you. Um, but that just means you need a little clarification. And, uh, and there's also just so much potential to really adapt this approach just like all the others so that it works with the way that you think. The ways you access it are working with a trained therapist. Um, as I said, there's many kinds. There's expressive arts therapists, and then there's art therapists, dance therapists, drama, it, the list goes on. Um, you can join a therapy group, which if groups scare you a little bit, or even if you like groups, it can be nice to be doing an activity together rather than just talking. Um, you can find a lot of online directives for using art in a therapeutic or relaxing way. Uh, you can take classes, even just kind of technical classes like an art class or a, in, join an improv club that's not therapy, but you still get some of those benefits. Um, you can also, as I showed the water lilies painting, you can view or listen to or experience the arts and that can have an effect for your anxiety, um, as well as finding things like workbooks, like writing processes or coloring or drawing books, things like that. So I invite you to just take a moment. We just went through a lot of different topics. Um, I'm gonna scan through the questions here and there'll be a poll coming up. My invitation for you is to just take a quick minute to reflect on what you just heard about. And um, you might find that one sticks out as being especially interesting to you. You might find that they all do or a couple do. But I'm just curious to hear and also for your own reflection, just choosing one that you think for you or the person that you're here on behalf of, you want to look a little more into or you want to kind of, you want to sign up for and try it out. Um, so there'll be a poll coming up that you can answer. Here it is. So while um, people are finishing up voting, I just want to address this question that came up in the process. It was about CBT, and thank you so much for asking it. Um, this person said that um, a, a person on the spectrum themselves said that they have trouble ex describing and um, figuring out the meaning of their inner experiences in words and that's something that can be hard with CBT. Um, it's helpful information here they shared that um, that it can be helpful to match to CBT categories um, so that sort of matching to labels and categories maybe could be part of the translation of what's going on inside and I'm, I'm wondering with this person I'm wondering if if approaches like the biofeedback connecting to the body or the expressive arts therapy sounded like a um, like a helpful alternative to using that thought-based processing. So that might be something to think about. So Tanya, yeah. it looks as it looks as though about half the people are interested in CBT right. and then the other half are spread equally around along the rest of the four. Okay, great. Good to know. Yeah, great. So CBT is a popular one. That tends to be true. Um, great. So let's move right on ahead to the next topics. Thank you for your questions and for answering those polls. So we'll go right along to complementary treatment. So these are treatments that are not um, mental health counseling specific, but there are other treatments that you might be able to access to help with your anxiety. First one is acupuncture. Um, I'm not sure if uh, this is familiar to anyone. If it's not, the the um, idea of little needles sticking into your skin might be a, a funny sounding idea. Just know that they're they're very very tiny and they only go in a tiny bit. Um, and a lot of people find the experience really relaxing. Just like anything else, it might not be right for everybody, but it's something that you might want to try out as a as a service that really directly affects your body's experience of the anxiety. 
I have a little picture on the bottom left here to remind you that and acupuncture is often done individually with one person going into an office privately, but also you can sometimes have the option of doing community acupuncture. You can look up you know, community acupuncture near me. You'd be in a room with other people. They're not talking or anything, but you're still in the room with other people. And that it can be a good good alternative, especially because it's usually cheaper than the individual acupuncture. So just a little bit about what acupuncture is. I'm not an acupuncturist and I don't know all the details, and, um, but I just wanna give you a sense of what, you're, what you would be looking into. Um, you can see this here is meridians and acupoints um, mapped out on the human body. They're, it's so detailed and the acupuncturists spend a lot of years studying these and they know it very well. Acupuncture is a um, traditional Chinese medicine um, that's been around for a very long time. And what happens is that the um, needles are placed on these acupoints and, the, and there's, a, um, there's a knowledge about the way that energy is supposed to flow along these lines. And the idea is that stimulating different parts of these will change the way that your energy is flowing through, perhaps allowing for more flow. Um, I'm not going to get into any more detail than that because that's basically all I know, but it is getting more and more popular and it can be a really good experience um, for some people. So why is it helpful for anxiety specifically? One, it addresses the physiological aspects. Again, it's working directly with the body. Another part is that it focuses on a relaxing experience. So acupuncture is typically all about just um, finding a way to calm your system down and relax. So it's a really good experience of just getting to take a break to experience that as a little kind of teaching your body that that's a state that it can be in. Uh, there's also minimal talking and sharing of, about yourself in this usually. Um, you might share more individually with a practitioner, but there's a little, there's less um, expectation to do that than with a therapist. So for some people, maybe this feels a little safer or it feels like a um, good place to relax because you don't have to share a lot about yourself. You're just receiving this service. Um, why is it good for Asperger Autism Profiles? Um, one is, again, that focus on the body for both, the, both people who experience sort of a strong sensitivity or sensory experience, as well as those with lower body awareness. Um, one note here is that, you know, if, um, if the idea of the needles feels like a little bit too much, there's also um, an alternative called acupressure that usually an acupuncturist can actually do for you, um, where there's just pressure put onto these points rather than a needle. So that might be a good alternative or even just a place to start as you, as you get to learn about this approach. Um, the way you access it is working individually with a trained acupuncturist. I, like I said, you can go to a community acupuncture, which also is all done, of course, by trained acupuncturists, just in a good group style. And then um, this is just kind of more of an aside because um, it's a much smaller piece, but you can learn about acupressure points for self-treatment. That's something that you could look up if that's something you wanted to try out. So let's move right along to another idea here. Um, so another is massage. So this is, an, there are all types of different massage therapists with all types of different approaches. But again, you're accessing the body, the body's experience. It can be especially helpful if you find that you hold tension from your anxiety in a certain part of your body. Massage can be a good way to reset, to let go of that tension and to teach your body to be able to calm down. Um, as I just said, it really addresses the physical part of anxiety, which is why it's so good for that. Um, just like acupuncture, it's, it's about having a relaxing experience. And just like acupuncture, there's usually minimal talking and sharing. So it's, a, um, it's less, um, less sharing than in a therapy process. So why is it good for Asperger Autism Profiles? Um, one is the focus on the body is helpful, again, for the, those with different types of body um, sensitivities or low awareness. Um, also, a lot of times, um, if you have sort of a, a fear or a sensitivity about physical touch, 
perhaps massage is then not a good idea for you, but in a way it might be actually a good idea because it can be a safe space where you can work with the massage therapist. You know what to expect um, it, with a really good massage therapist who's flexible. They can um, really respond to your needs and this could even actually help you get a little more used to that, that touch experience. And also typically um, for people on the Asperger autism spectrum, um, deep pressure touch tends to be more desired than light touch. And so looking for those deep, deeper massage approaches can, could be a helpful way to go. And as I said, a practitioner who is really responsive to sensory needs is going to be really important here. It really is important across all the areas, but especially um, if you have a sensitivity to touch in any way, working with someone who's able to respond to when you tell them um, what you need and what doesn't feel comfortable and what does. And typically you're really going to find that in a massage therapist, but there might be some that are really especially good at um, being creative and adapting in ways that are really helpful. So again, you work with a massage therapist, you could research, there's all sorts of kinds, um, we don't have time to go through all those. Um, and again, there's always ways that you can access this yourself. So you can, there's um, self massage techniques you could look up, you basically any part you could reach, like you could massage your neck, there's some techniques you could use. Um, and there's also massage tools such as like something to roll your feet on, or there's the tools where you can actually reach your back with it. Um, or there's, uh, there what am I thinking of? Um, well, there's a whole lot of other massage tools that you can use to help you um, to, to access this yourself. So go right on along. Another approach is yoga. And um, yoga is not just for those who are extremely flexible and athletic already. Yoga, one great thing about it is there are a ton of different kinds and also just within the practice of yoga, it can be adapted to sort of the skill level that you're at. Um, so let's jump right into the reasons that it's helpful. Um, I, I, yoga is really the practice of a, a series of poses and in some practices, it's it's uh, regimented, and some it's it shifts every time you go to a class. Um, but you can get kind of familiar with certain poses that are often repeated again and again. And it is structured in a way where you're aiming for a certain way that your body is going to be posed. So the reasons it's good for anxiety, just like these other physical approaches, is that it addresses the your body. It, it addresses the way you experience things in your body. Again, you're not talking about your feelings. You're doing this physical approach instead. And also one thing that's really great with yoga is oftentimes in classes, the teacher is going to be reminding you on how to deal with this or, or really change the way you experience this mind-body connection. There'll be these reminders to connect back to the present moment, to connect back to how it feels in your body. And you can kind of learn a little bit through yoga how to change what's happening in your mind first by starting with what's happening in your body, a little bit um, the opposite of CBT in, in some general way. So why is it good for Asperger autism profiles? Um, Again, that focus on the body for those of you with any um, variety of sensory sensitivities or body awareness can be really helpful. Um, it's typically done in a group, so it can be both an opportunity for social connection if that's what you want, or it can be an opportunity to be out and about with people but not having to small talk and have a lot of interaction, um, or it can just be you know, really kind of private, even when it happens in classes, typically it's pretty quiet. You don't actually talk in class, so it can be a lot of things. Um, there's also, as I said, many different types, different skill levels, and the poses can be adapted person to person. So it can really be made to fit to any, any person, depending, and it doesn't matter where you are skill-wise. Um, as I said, you can go to yoga class. That's typically the most common way to access it. But there are also yoga therapists. You can meet with a therapist one-on-one -on -one who teaches you yoga and talks with you a little bit more in depth about the relation to that what's happening in your mind and what's happening in your body. So you might even find that you work individually with someone doing yoga as a therapeutic approach. And just like a lot of these, there's information online and with yoga, you can look up online yoga videos a lot of times for free um, and, and try out yoga in the comfort in your own of your own home. And of course, there's apps just like there are for a lot of things for the yoga. 
um, Tai Chi and Qigong. Um, there's a lot of different approaches even beyond these two. There's a lot of types of martial arts that might be beneficial, um, but these two are especially often geared um, toward learning skills that would be helpful for anxiety. Tai Chi and Qigong are, are different, though they're pretty similar um, as, as a newcomer. They're a series, learning a series of poses and movements where you're really aligning your mind and your breathing and your body. And typically Tai Chi and Qigong are done really slowly. And so there's a slowing down, there's this idea of really connecting to the present moment and the simplicity of the movements that you do. Also, typically, um, there might be movements that take a little practice to do exactly right, but there's, um, they're often very simple, so it's very accessible. And I, and I say you learn to do them right, but also there's a lot of flexibility of doing them for what is right for your body and doing them for where you're at. So why is it helpful for anxiety? Um, again, it's, it's addressing your body's experience. You're not having to talk a lot in this experience. It might feel more safe for you. You're getting that experience of connecting the feelings in your body to the experiences in your mind. Um, and for Asperger autism profiles, again, it's connecting you with that body awareness it's typically done in a group. So again, it can be a social connection experience. There can be sometimes groups of people who meet together to do this together, or you might go to a class to do this. Or again, you can go but not have that social connection. Um, and then another thing that's really helpful, um, this is true of yoga, but especially of Tai Chi and Qigong, is that there is this focus on the structure of them and there's a lot of repetition and so for someone who really likes to master um, something and know what to expect and really um, both know what to expect within the session as well as kind of creating a structure and a schedule that you come back to so that you actually do tai chi once or twice or three times a week um, not just once there's this encouragement to continue on with it you can take a class, you can work with an individual teacher, and again, there's online videos, there's apps where you can learn about this as well. So huge category and related to yoga and Tai Chi and Qigong, but just exercise in general is really worth putting in here. Um, you can use exercise for your mental health, and while you're not going to be talking with someone as a therapist, typically, you can talk, meet with somebody and um, find a, a personal trainer who can help you with fitness, help you get your body feeling a little bit more comfortable. A lot of people find jogging or walking as being very helpful with their anxiety. It helps you release um, tension or energy. When you have anxiety, um, you often get this adrenaline or this fight, flight, or freeze response in your body. So if you can do some exercise that actually works out that energy that can be really helpful things like running and walking especially you can bring in the concepts of mindfulness that we talked about and practice being in the present moment in that process and so exercise can in, in many many ways can be very helpful again it addresses the body of course um, it's really similar to yoga and the other approaches. You're, you're being able to connect with your body and you're also getting a chance to, you know, you can exercise in, alone. You can do it at your home. You can do it um, by going for a walk or run on your own or you can join a group. You can play some sports. You can do all sorts of things where you can kind of pair this social experience or you can do something on your own. So you act, can access it so many ways even beyond this list, but of course classes, personal trainers, just directing yourself, looking up online videos and apps as well. So meditation, um, of course, very re related to mindfulness, um, but there are a lot of ways that you can experience meditation either with the help of a professional or on your own or going to a group. Meditation is also becoming more and more popular um, outside of the mental health counseling or sort of religious spiritual areas. You can find a lot of meditation groups in a lot of areas that are just there for the process of the meditation. And you can find a lot of resources as well to teach you how to meditate. And so with meditation, 
just like with mindfulness, you can experience it in a lot of different ways. Oftentimes, as you see these people, you're sitting in meditation with your eyes closed or a soft gaze, and you're typically finding something to focus on, such as your breath. Um, or some people like to use um, what's called a mantra, which is something that you repeat in your mind. It could be a word such as peace. It could be a phrase such as I am calm or I can do this. Um, it, so basically with meditation, um, there's sort of a, a misconception a lot of times that meditation is about clearing out your mind and not thinking about anything. But we've been doing um, meditation in the world for a long time for everyone to know that that's not really how your mind works. Your mind is meant to be thinking. It's meant to be in process. And so what we do in meditation is we pick one or perhaps more, but usually one sort of what we call object to focus on, which could be a literal physical object, or it could be a thought, or it could be your breath, or it could be, um, like we saw the drawing um, Zen tangles before, it could be a process like drawing meditation. It's that practice of bringing yourself to focus on one thing. And the other part of meditation is that there's this, this understanding you develop that meditation is not something to accomplish where you're able to always just exactly meditate and only think of one thing. Meditation is all about that process of getting distracted and bringing yourself back to the thing you're trying to focus on. And that's a skill that you really need to learn when it comes to anxiety. You get distracted by the anxious thought and you learn to redirect yourself to something that is happening in the present or something more positive. And meditation, the more you, really, the more you get distracted in meditation, the, the more helpful the practice is because the more, that means the more times you get to learn to bring yourself back. So why is it help for, helpful for anxiety? Um, again, this approach is gonna have minimal talking and sharing, and so that might, again, feel like a safe practice for you. Um, it, it's the focus on the mind-body connection. Oftentimes you are focusing on something like the breath, or sometimes you do something like a body scan where you pay attention to certain parts of the body one at a time. Um, that can be very difficult for some people to focus on the breath or difficult to focus on specific parts of the body. And so that either might mean that meditation will be helpful to help you practice that or you might need a different kind of meditation maybe you need a guided visualization where you're imagining perhaps um, leaves flowing down on a river or you're thinking of a phrase over and over like we talked about before so again meditation can be adapted to a lot of different approaches so also, meditation, like I said, it's this idea of retraining your brain to have a different relationship to your thoughts, have a different process going on. So you're not just having your thoughts happen to you and control you. You're realizing that you can pay attention to your thoughts and you can redirect yourself to what is happening. Why is it good for Asperger autism profiles? Um, it can be helpful, again, if you're focusing on the body. It can be helpful because you have this option of doing it individually or in a group with meditation. You can really do it alone in your own home, although it's really helpful to get some instruction but with, from someone to help you out. Um, you can really actually do it on your own and make it yours. You can do it any time of day that you would like. You can do it on a schedule, which is ultimately the most helpful but if that doesn't work for you you can do it just whenever you're feeling anxious you can meditate or just whenever you have time um, the simplicity of meditation and the structure and the repetition of the same thing can be really helpful um, you can find that not having to think of new ways to approach your anxiety all the time could be helpful if you just have this one approach to go back to um, and the ways, oops, the ways that it's helpful for, um, for someone with Asperger autism profiles in terms of retraining your relationship with your thoughts is just, again, that ability to know that the thoughts are separate from, from who you are and they're not controlling you. 
So you access this with a class, you can go to a group, you could find a meditation teacher at some, in some areas. Um, you can find online videos that guide you through a meditation. There are, are many, many apps. There might be, this might be the one that has the most apps available for meditation. And um, there's also, of course, that self-directed making it your own. And there's a lot of reading available to learn how to approach meditation as well. So with complementary treatment, this is um, our list that we went through. And again, I'm asking the same question just to hear what people feel like they might be interested in. And also just to give you a little bit of time to reflect on what stood out for you. We'll have a, a poll come up for you to choose one that that's sparking your interest the most that you might want to try. You might want to look up a little bit more. And I definitely suggest you to look up and try out many of these, but this is just to sort of bring a little focus in on what's standing out for you. So as people start to vote, Tanya, it looks as though about half are saying that they're interested in exercise, followed by uh, meditation and massage. Great, great. Awesome. Mm -hmm. If anyone wanted to chime in with what kinds of exercise, that might be interesting to hear. And you're welcome to type that into the chat box you'd like to share and I'll read it out. One um, type of exercise that actually comes up often is kickboxing, um, which is of course really interactive and really structured and um, can be really fun and can also help you let out some steam. So that's one thing to throw out there. Um, someone suggested weightlifting helps. Another person saying running. Riding a bike, definitely. Great. So we'll go on to thank you, everyone, for for sharing. Um, oh, we have another comment here that I think is helpful. Um, that the the things where someone has to stay still is very difficult. Um, and that can totally be true. And that might mean that, you know, exercise is just a better approach. It might mean that you start out um, with a with with something that has a little bit of movement to it, and then you try meditation. Just one moment, I'm going to refresh my screen here. Oh, we also got another um, another idea, hiking in nature. It's a great one too. Oh, and horseback riding. Great. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some more self-directed approaches, and you'll see these might overlap with the things that we talked about as well. Um, but this is these are things that, um, you might want to supplement these other approaches with or just add to your list of op options here. So pet pets are one option. Um, probably people have heard of pet therapy of different kinds. Um, if you have a sort of awe reaction to these photos, that might be a good thing to look into. And as you see, there's, um, there's this dog with this actual official um, official uniform here as well as just having a cat having a pet cat um animals for some people are 
not as much of an interest, but for some people there, something that helps you to calm down, to relax, to go home to, that can be really helpful. So when it comes to pets and using them in therapeutic ways, I just wanted to give us a, an overview of what the options are in a more technical terms. So in terms of therapy animals, um, you, we're dealing with four different categories. One is um, called therapy animals, and this is when there is a professional working who has a trained animal who might come into a hospital or a nursing home or a group home or some sort of setting where they're they're being brought in as a therapeutic intervention. Um, this is not something that you typically access individually. It's more something that's provided, though you might happen to find a therapist here and there who um, brings an animal into their practice who might just be a pet or might be a therapy animal. There's also service animals, which are probably one of the more familiar ones, uh, which is animals who are trained to perform a lot of different tasks for someone, perhaps someone who's blind, someone who's physically disabled, someone who really needs a lot of assistance day to day with a lot of different tasks or needs to have an animal that's really um, strongly trained to help them stay safe. The two that we're talking about a little bit more for that might be more relevant. Um, one is a psychiatric service dog, and it's called service dog, but it actually can technically be some other animals that are trained, um, such as a miniature horse. Um, but for psychiatric service dogs, um, this is a an animal that is trained to be able to perform a task, and these are appropriate and need to be you need a therapist to write a, a letter determining that you have some kind of need that that prevents you that that significantly um, your mental health impacts your ability to to perform a task that you really actually need to, to get through your day to day life. Um, this can be the ones we're more familiar with, such as. Um, being able to walk if you're through the city if you're blind or it can be actually mental health getting in the way of things like being able to go do your shopping or being able to go into work or being able to go talk with people um, so psychiatric service dogs can actually be applied for with the more si more significant mental health concerns um, probably the most likely that we're looking at here is emotional support animals and so these animals they might possibly be trained but they actually don't need to be trained they don't need to be able to help you complete a task like the psychiatric service dogs do emotional support animals are really what it sounds like they're your pets that you have that help you to get through your life, get through certain situations. Um, these animals can be registered um, legally so that you can have just more flow with the um, experience of getting permission to have them come into spaces where animals aren't normally allowed. All of these animals are allowed into spaces where um, perhaps you're going to an event that allows no pets. You, you, do, you are um, able to bring an emotional support animal, if you're able to bring these pets, um, with exceptions, of course, you're able to bring these pets onto airplanes, you're able to bring emotional support animals um, into housing that doesn't technically allow animals, um, though of course there's um, reasonable flexibility, so if you have an emotional support horse and you are trying to live in an apartment obviously that's not allowed um, but there so there's there's some wiggle room but really um, you know if you have certain housing that doesn't allow certain kinds of dogs and you have a registered emotional support dog of that kind tech, legally you are allowed to bring that animal into any space um, again with reasonable exceptions so I want people to be aware that there are these options it's also something to think about in terms of um, college um, if someone needs a pet at college um, this is something to know that there are actually technical options and that at the same time you don't need to you, you don't actually need to register, such as, for example, an emotional support animal, you don't need to register them for them to have that effect, of course. But again, it's recommended in order to get through situations where they wouldn't normally be allowed to be in. Um, but if, if you don't aren't running into sort of any of those barriers and you just need a pet that you can bring with you to 
to reasonable places or you can go home to, pets are just something for you to think about. And let's talk a little bit about that. Um, so why are they helpful for anxiety? Um, if you have pets, you probably just feel like this is um, <laughs> common knowledge. It's, it's a natural sort of calming effect. Um, they, they, they can be helpful with anxiety because especially with these um, official um, therapy pets, you can bring them into situations that might be anxiety provoking and sort of knowing that they're there can help you calm down. Um, and also these animals um, can be sometimes specifically trained to be well responsive to your anxiety, to your anxious situations. They can be, um, it could be a pet that just, um, you know, is itself and is just an animal free. Um, or it might be a dog that's trained to be especially calm and to do whatever you need it to do um, without kind of misbehaving or getting distracted. Um, also, so for Asperger autism profiles, pets can be especially helpful because they can offer some companionship, especially if you're feeling kind of isolated or if you're feeling like you can't handle socializing, but you do want to not be alone even just in that moment pets can be really helpful. Um, you're going to want to think about if caring and the responsibility for of an animal is something you can take on, um, both for yourself as well as the benefit of the animal, making sure that that is something that's possible. But at the same time, for someone um, with Asperger's autism profile that really excels with structure and gets motivated by an animal, then having that structure of caring for the animal could be a great benefit. Um, physical contact with the animal can be really helpful. We already talked about sometimes the tendency to have more sensitivity with person-to-person -person touch. So even just being able to pet a cat or have it sit on your lap is, can be a nice experience to be able to have. And also these pets, you don't, oftentimes if they, especially if they have a vest on, the expectation is they're, they're not distracted by other people. But, you know, bringing an animal around with you can also sometimes just practically be a nice way to make connections with other people. They'll want to come up to you and, and talk with you and, and pet the animal. And it can be almost kind of a bridge even. How do you access them? Like we said, there's a few different levels. You can look, um, I have resources at the end of these slides um, where you can click a link to find more information about searching for these um, animals. But you can find a trained um, psychiatric service dog. Um, you can find an emotional support animal who might be trained or just have a find a pet and then register as an emotional support animal. You can again just get a pet. Um, and also, as I said, there's sometimes opportunity for treatment with therapy animals, though it's typically more in a group setting. So not even technically a specific approach, but um, sensory adaptations is something that's worth mentioning. We need to remember that um, we have these different sensory experiences that we can address either with the changes in, in environment, changes in ourselves, or perhaps wearing sunglasses, hats to react to sun, um, and also sensory experiences such as having a fidget toy. So knowing that these are options that you can impose yourself, as well as making sure that you're working with practitioners who understand that you do need them to change the lighting in the room for you to be able to focus or they they understand why you need to have sunglasses on um, while you're doing therapy even though it doesn't seem appropriate or they can help you think of ways to have fidget toys or to use different sensory processes to help you manage your anxiety. Um, I bring this up for, with anxiety because um, sensory stressors are often overlooked. It's something that we don't necessarily pay a lot of attention to as a culture. Um, we tend to think about our thoughts and situations more than just sensorily what's going on. Um, it gives your, and also things, especially like fidget toys, gives your body a different way to react to stressful experiences. Um, and oftentimes for Asperger autism profiles, people often have, or even just anyone, have at least one kind of sensory sensitivity. So paying attention to this and, and knowing what it is is really important. And have, or again, working with a practitioner who understands and responds to it is really important. And so, of course, um, how do you access it? It's more about how do you, how do you make changes and it's changes to environment, changes to protect yourself, um, fidget toys, changes in lifestyle.
So someone already mentioned hiking in nature. Um, nature is also a, another great access to um, to anxiety relief. There was actually recently a study by Stanford University where they had people go out on um, walks in nature versus people who just went on a walk in the city. And they, they found a lot from that. They um, concluded that the nature experience directly reduces rumination. And rumination um, might be a really familiar word for you because it is common with Asperger autism profiles. Um, but rumination is essentially just the that self-reflection and repetition of thoughts about yourself often worries. It's sort of that a lot of people talk about cycling through thoughts or spiraling through thoughts. And they noticed a, a, a re reduced activation in subgenual prefrontal cortex, which is a part of the brain. And I won't go into that a lot, but again, that is associated with um, that self-focused behavioral withdrawal at, that is linked to rumination. So it's that withdrawal into the self and reflecting on the self, which often can turn into um, anxieties about yourself, about self-consciousness, about feeling disconnected. And here is a list of a few things they they have found reported in studies on nature experiences is that there's this soft fascination that happens. There's this sense of belonging that can even happen. People feel more connected to the space that they're in. Um, and also this sense of being away, that they're leaving the normal life or normal environment. So it's helpful for anxiety um, for these reasons we just explained, that there's nature tends to bring us naturally into a greater state of calm. And also, um, especially if you don't live in a natural area, going out to a different space can help you feel more separate from life's everyday problems and perhaps get some more perspective. Um, for As Asperger autism profiles, this can both be sort of chance for alone time, if that's important, and also be a chance for a group experience or, or experience with another person going out to spend time in nature could be a great way to make friends or to spend time with friends. Um, and of course, as I said, rumination can be such a common part of um, anxiety for people with Asperger autism profiles. So it, the direct effect on that could be really helpful. And so, of course, you can access this in a lot of different ways, like parks and hiking. And, and as I said, groups of people, you might even find meetup groups of people who like to go be out, out, outside in nature. So there's a whole lot of ways to access this. So reading. This is going to overlap with a lot of other things, but this is just to remind us there there's a lot of ways that reading books or articles or other resources can be really helpful in the in the practice of dealing with anxiety. Um, some resources will help us understand how anxiety works. They're educational. There might be resources that talk about a specific approach, like a CB a book on CBT or a book on mindfulness. Um, there might be practice texts that actually guide you through a practice. As, as if you were working with a therapist, but you're doing this kind of on your own. Um, there are books out there from people on the spectrum about their accounts um, with anxiety as well, just in general, which can be really helpful to feel not so alone, also learn from their experiences. There's also books that you can connect with on a more sort of spiritual or worldview level. You might connect with a certain religion and read that, and that helps you reframe the way you worry about your life, or even just um, non-religious approaches, things like mindfulness might help you to change the way that you view the world. Um, and again, reading even just about anything other than anxiety can be a relaxing experience that you might be worth trying. So it's helpful, again, for learning techniques, learning about anxiety, um, addressing dish deeper issues of anxiety, taking a break from your life to read about something else. Um, for As Asperger autism profiles, you're learning practical skills. You, you can find books sometimes with structure. It's something you can do independently if you really like to kind of take things on yourself or something that you can do independently outside of your therapy treatment and that it can work together with what you're doing in therapy. Um, and it can also help you, again, not feel alone. If you feel sort of alien to other people around you, you can read about other people that you relate to. Um, and again, books, articles, online resources, audio books as well, if, you, if the reading part isn't great for you, um, or educational videos are out there. So 
we'll talk a little bit about apps. Um, there's so many out there. Uh, there's these are just a few examples, not even necessarily the top three. It's just a few that are popular out there. Um, one is called Happify. It's very game oriented. It was created actually by someone who was coping with depression and she was a game designer. And so she made this really um, rewarding and fun um, headspace is a mindfulness app that teaches you a lot of techniques. Um, Mood Kit is a CBT based process and um, it helps you feel better um, by changing the ways you think. Oops, there we go. And um, also just a little specific focus on biofeedback apps and wearables. Um, I'm not going to go a lot into this, but just knowing that there are apps that where your phone can actually measure things physically. For example, Stress Check measures your um, heart rate variability by pressing your finger against the flash on your phone. Um, these other wearables here can measure things like temperature, like um, your pulse, all sorts of things. And they also can keep track of your experiences over time. So this can help you to have an experience um, of knowing what's happening and not just getting stuck in the moment, but noticing change over time or noticing patterns. So a lot of reasons these are helpful. Um, they're educating you, you have constant access to them, they're tracking this long-term experience, um, their, their structure, they can you know, do them on your own, they connect with your body, and also they're typically free, or they're less than $5, or they have some sort of what they call in-app purchases. And as I said, you can buy or, or download free apps, you can purchase the wearables, and also ideally you could try to work with a, with a trained therapist who can teach you how to use that in the process of your mental health. So a lot of overlap here, there's online resources for basically everything we talked about, but there's also some things to note that you can do online therapy, you can get into programs that ha that are structured sort of like an online class of how to deal with your anxiety. You can go onto forums that are directed at anxiety to help you talk with other people, find solutions. You're going to want to be really careful about what you sign up for online. Make sure it's a legitimate um, confirmed practice done by a licensed therapist that there's you check the reviews on things. Um, there's actually a resource at the end of this um, presentation when you click online resources there's actually an article that helps you decide what's right for you and make sure you you choose something that's um, reliable it can be really helpful for anxiety because you can again learn so many techniques you can do it from home um, for Asperger autism profiles it can be really affordable possibly it can be something that you can access especially if you're in an area where you don't have a lot of local expertise about Asperger autism profiles you can have access to somebody who's farther away um, and again there's online programs working with an online therapist audio video meditations and forums and so much more so last poll of the night and then perhaps you can take a couple minutes for questions. I know we're close on time, but just a quick reflection on these self-directed approaches. I'm wondering what's standing out for people, what you might think about using in the future. So it looks as though nature and apps and wearables are just about split right. along with um, reading and sensory adaptations and pets. Awesome. Okay. So they're all kind of split across those. They are. Okay. Great. Honest. Uh, great. Let's see. So um, we're going to actually move on.
um, to questions if anybody has them um, before I answer them I'll just have you know you're getting you or you've actually already received I believe the um, PDF version of this and these all, these are all links to just kind of a starting point to learn more some of them also connect you with ways to get referrals and some of them are just information about how you can learn more um, and there's so much more out there beyond what I have linked here but this is hopefully just a good way to get you started um, and while you're looking at that, um, I invite you to also just send in a couple questions if you have them. I'll see what I have popped up already and we'll get some questions answered. So while, so while the viewers are doing that, we do have a comment. Um, someone is talking about how screen addiction is a huge issue with young adults and that um, they're avoiding anything with a screen. Mm -hmm. That's a really good thing to remind us of. Um, if if that's, of course, if that's something that's a challenge, then you don't want to sort of perpetuate that that habit that's getting in the way. So you, I, I, I would definitely recommend in that case to look for some other approaches. If, um, you know, if, if, if there's this strong interest in working with computers or phones, but it's not to the level of a screen addiction that's getting in the way, then that's more reason to possibly do these approaches because it's really motivating and it might be something that someone's more likely to use often. But if using these technolo technological devices is bringing them out of what they need to be doing, then of course we need to go for some of those other approaches that we listed here in the presentation. Any other questions? I don't see any others coming up right now. Okay. Um, we can give well, it another moment or so. Um, we might see a, a couple pop up if you have them, but otherwise I just want to say um, we have this slide here. I don't know if Joanne wants to say anything about it, but this just gives us an overview of what's um, available from AE&E to help. AE&E is a place you can go if you want to get some referrals to some of these um, ap approaches. AE&E is not going to have names for all of them, more so the um, psychological um, psychotherapy approaches. Um, but you can al al always contact them to see if what they can connect you with. And my email, um, I'm also at AE&E. It's, it's tanya.white at AE&E.org. It's at the beginning of the presentation and you can contact me. So we also have a, a great comment here. Pets don't require a constant eye contact. Even some animals don't like it, so there you go. <laughs> so pets can be a really great way to connect. So I think that, probably, that might be it for questions. Um, and I'll let Joanne chime in maybe with the co conclusion. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Thank you for watching. I hope this was helpful to get you started in understanding some different types of approaches. And we are here and available if more questions come up in the future. Excellent. Thank you, Tanya. And yes, I just shared with everyone a link. You'll see it on your chat feature. Um, it's a short survey. I'm going to ask. Um, you can take a moment and click on that and then it'll bring up a, a short evaluation from tonight's talk. And as Tanya said, um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact her or you can contact, um, you can contact the main line at a and &E, And um, up on the board are a number of resources that we do offer, including um, different types of coaching groups, support groups, um, webinars such as what you're hearing tonight, as well as in-person workshops. Um, and but Tanya, I'd like to thank you very much for doing this. I think you had a ton of information for everyone, and um, I, I think people are digesting it, and you will probably re be receiving questions uh, later on or for tomorrow. Okay, my pleasure. Yeah, that sounds great. I hope that um, People continue to explore these. There's so much more information even than that was in here. So there's a lot to learn and a lot of ways to make uh, therapeutic approaches work together and work for each person. So thank you, everybody. Excellent. So with that, I'm going to say good night. And um, next on July 12th will be our next webinar in the anxiety series. And that will be on 
um, focusing on anxiety and medications, this time with a twist towards um, parents of children and teens. If you have any questions about that, feel free to email me. And again, um, thanks, Tanya, and good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye.